Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Innovation Tax Relief um, webinar. It's going to be hosted by our resident expert, Caroline Walden. She's head of Innovation Tax Group. We're also delighted to be uh, joined by John Pryor. He's CEO of Exalt IP. Um, this is a series of webinars that we are doing um, for Claritas Tax. Um, so we will let you know when the next date is at the end of this webinar. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. You are all on mute and obviously your cameras are off. It is quite a um, big webinar, uh, lots of content today. So we are gonna try our best for Q and A's a bit later, but if you can type it into the Q and A function, if we don't have time and we run out, um, I will take note of who's written that question and we will email you directly. So I hope that's okay. And um, without further ado, over to Caroline and John. Thanks very much, Talia. Um, Talia, if we, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the um, webinar today. Um, Talia, if you can um, move on to the uh, first slide, please. Um, this is uh, intended to set the tone for today, really, um, hopefully generate a few laughs at the start, um, but obviously um, quite a serious, quite a serious, serious matter as I'll come on to, to discuss. Um, it's fair to say that since March 2021, um, the UK R&D tax relief landscape has been the subject of major reform, which has led to firstly a lot of work for professional advisors such as myself and others to get to grips with the major changes. Um, these are not just changes in the rates of tax relief applicable from the 1st of April 23 and then from the 1st of April 24, um, but also changes in um, allowable expenditure and also massive changes as far as making sure claims are compliant is, are concerned. Um, but the reforms have also, I think it's fair to say, um, led to um, large a large amount of um you know confusion and anxiety for taxpayers and 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 agents within in the profession as increased compliance activity on the part of hmrc has led to more compliance checks um, and with those compliance checks um, some uncertainty as to whether historic submissions will be accepted by hmrc and and in fact, whether new claim submissions will be accepted by um, HMRC, because it's um, you know it's fair to say, as I'll, I'll, come, I'll as I'll allude to later, um, the compliance approach approach that's been currently adopted by HMRC um, is um, significantly different to what many advisors will have experienced in the past. Um, whilst the um, R and D tax relief reforms affect all companies, um, it is fair to say that it's SMEs that um, have borne the full, the, the major brunt of the reforms, and that is certainly where HMRC's heightened or increased compliance effort is focused. Um, the good news is that, um, save for um, a compliance action plan, which we are waiting for, um, and also um, possible regulation of the um, R and D tax relief industry as a whole. And there's also more guidance coming in later on this year on the on the topic of um, subcontracted R&D. HMRC has said that um, now that the new merge scheme um, and now that the new ERIS scheme um, have been have been announced, they are they are coming into play. The merge scheme is coming into operation for accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 24. Um, HMRC has said that all major reforms to the R&D tax relief schemes are complete. They are here. So taxpayers and agents can breathe a sigh of relief as there is at least now some certainty as regards the applicable rates of tax relief available. And the merge scheme does provide some simplicity um, as the same rules apply to companies of all size, unless of course, it's an R&D intensive loss making SME claiming under the ERIS scheme. Um, unfortunately, HMRC's concerns about the high level of fraud and abuse in the area of R&D tax relief continues and it's clear that there is no end in sight yet to the volume compliance approach that has been um, instigated by HMRC to investigate fraud and abuse of the reliefs and importantly to target those agents responsible for perpetrating it throughout the industry. Um, I have to say that um, we've got 38 slides to go through and um, there's not enough time to, today to discuss and provide worked examples of how claims will be calculated under the new schemes. Um, like Talia said, if anybody has questions about um, about this or in fact any individual matters that are discussed today, um, I'd be grateful if you could please put a question into the Q&A box or people can message me directly afterwards. 
Um, you know, certainly my view is that um, some of the topics that I'm going to be covering today at high level really deserve almost like individual webinars on their own. Um, it's just not possible to go into all the um, intricacies and the nuances of various things during this one hour session. Um, this webinar is in three parts. Um, I'm going to go through the major changes to R&D tax relief in part one. Um, and then I will discuss HMRC's compliance approach at part three. At part two, um, John Pryor here today um, is going to speak about intellectual property and the value of intellectual property to, to a business. Now, I know I realise that's not strictly speaking about tax per se, um, but we really wanted to include a section about IP in the webinar today um, to inform you about something which can add real value to a, to a client's business or your business if you are a company owner here um, from the R&D activity um, which you will have carried out. So before I launch into the R&D tax relief reforms, let's go back to where um, this all started. At Spring Budget 21, the government launched a review of R&D tax reliefs to ensure the UK remains a competitive location for cutting edge research. Um, the review was also to ensure that the reliefs that the government was satisfied that the reliefs continue to be fit for purpose and that taxpayer money is effectively targeted because this is public money. The result was a report concluding, unfortunately, that the reliefs under the SME scheme did not deliver an adequate return for money, particularly when compared to the RDEX scheme. The report also concluded that the SME scheme was the subject of widespread fraud and abuse. Um, and um, the report also um, concluded that the expenditure attracting the relief, so the R&D expenditure attracting the relief, needed to be expanded upon to reflect modern company R&D practices. The government consulted on the proposed changes to the R&D tax credit schemes over a considerable period. This included a broad consultation in spring 21, a policy consultation on merging schemes in winter 23, and a technical consultation on the draft legislation for a merged scheme in summer 23. At autumn statement 23, the government announced it would legislate in autumn finance bill 23 to merge the current RDEC and R&D SME schemes for accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April this year. As I said earlier, this review has now concluded with the announcement of the merge scheme and a separate scheme for R&D intensive SMEs. In addition, a host of other measures have been introduced to attempt to reduce fraud and error in the SME scheme, which includes additional guidance issued on the subject of compliance to help companies to get matters right before claiming. As I say, the government has said that this is not enough and further action may be needed to reduce the, what they say are an unacceptably high levels of non-compliance in R&D tax release. The publication of a compliance action plan is awaited, as well as news concerning the possible regulation of the industry. That's um, currently a consultation that's ongoing. Um, so without um, further ado, um, Tyler, if you could please change to the, the next slide. Okay. This slide <clears throat> summarises the changes in the rates of R&D tax relief between R&D expenditure incurred before the 1st of April 23, expenditure incurred from the 1st of April 23, and claims made in respect of accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 24. As I've already stated, the SME R&D scheme and the old RDEX scheme will be abolished for accounting periods on or after 1st of April 24 replaced by the merge scheme and ERIS. The government introduced a change in the rate of R&D tax relief available to SMEs claiming under the SME R&D tax relief scheme for expenditure incurred after 1st of April 23. The enhanced deduction, previously claimable at 130% of qualifying R&D expenditure, was reduced to 86%. And the payable tax credit available to loss-making companies was reduced from 14.5% to 10%. The reason for this reduction was because the government considered that the benefit available to SMEs did not represent good value for money, and there was concern that the, um, the high rate of relief that was previously allowable was um, enticing companies and some agents to abuse the scheme. Conversely, for expenditure spent by large companies and SMEs claiming under the RDEX scheme, the value of the expenditure credit increased from 13% to 20% for expenditure incurred from the 1st of April 23, on account of the government um, being of the opinion that the um, RDEX scheme represented better value for money. And certainly, as I say, in terms of HMRC's compliance focus, 
it's very much focused, it's very much addressed to SMEs and, la and not large companies. On account of outcry from SME startups, often loss making, who very much rely on R&D tax credits for investment in their early years of trading, the government has implemented a separate scheme for loss making R&D intensive SMEs. Um, this is called ERIS or the Enhanced R&D Intensive Scheme, but I'll refer to it in the, in, the, in the webinar as ERIS. Companies that satisfy the criteria for claiming under this scheme are able to claim the enhanced deduction of 86% of qualifying R&D expenditure, together with a tax credit equal to 14.5% of the surrendable value. This was implemented from the 1st of April 23 for companies that were able to satisfy an R&D intensity criteria of 40%. As, stated, as I've stated um, previously, for accounting periods on or after the 1st of April 24, the old SME R&D scheme and the old RDEX scheme um, will be abolished, and we're now left with the new merge scheme and ERIS. The intensity condition for companies able to claim under ERIS um, has been reduced to 30% um, from 40% for accounting periods beginning um, from the 1st of April 24. And um, Tali, if you can now go on to the next slide, where I'll just explain a little bit more about the merge scheme and ERIS. So just some, just some general points about both schemes. Um, first of all, the tax definition of R&D is identical across both schemes. In fact, um, there has been little alteration to the tax definition of R&D as far as R&D tax relief is concerned for some time. Um, the definition was expanded to include advances in pure maths for accounting periods from the 1st of April 23, um, but the tax definition essentially um, has remained the same, and I'll, I'll just give you a little reminder in terms of what that is shortly. Secondly, um, the categories of qualifying expenditure are the same across both schemes, which is quite significant, and this is very much where the government wanted was very keen to introduce simplicity in the schemes. As those who will have administered the R&D SME scheme and RDEP previously will know, there are differences in the um, categories of qualifying expenditure that, that were claimable, um, particularly around subcontracted R&D expenditure. Um, but going forward, the categories of qualifying expenditure are the same. The differences between ERIS and the merge scheme um, relate to the rates of relief that are available and how the, how the tax benefit is calculated. And it's important to note that even if a company is eligible to claim under ERIS, so it's an R&D loss making intensive company, um, it can still choose to claim under the merge scheme. But obviously, it's not possible to claim for the same expenditure under both schemes. It's not possible to double count. Next slide, please, Talia. So, um, as I say, there's not enough time today to go into a sample calculation of what um, an R&D tax relief claim might look like under, under the new merge scheme. And I'm going to call it RDEC. It's the new RDEC. So going forwards, um, this will be an above the line taxable credit, which will allow companies to claim for their qualifying expenditure, including, as I say, contracted out R&D, and it incorporates the more generous SME, pay, PAYE and NI contributions cap. Um, the rate of um, the, the credit is 20%. That's in line with the, um, with the RDEC rate for expenditure before the 1st of April 24. Going forward under the merge scheme, there's no restriction on companies being able to claim for subsidised expenditure. So that's a massive departure. As people will be aware, SMEs claiming under the SME R&D scheme were previously um, precluded from claiming for um, subsidised expenditure. If there was such a claim, it would have to be claimed under, under RDEC rules. But as I say, going forward under the merge scheme, there are no restrictions on claiming subsidised expenditure. As I say, um, the calculation and the payment steps are broadly the same as the old RDEX scheme. However, um, a lower rate of notional tax restriction, 19%, applies at step two of the payment um, steps, which is applicable to small profit makers and loss making companies, and a more generous PAYE cap applies. Different rates apply to ring fence trades. Um, the RDEC can be used to pay other tax liabilities a company may be liable for or lead to the payment of credit to the company. So just to be, just to clarify, um, the merge scheme is applicable to all companies in respect of accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 24, um, including profitable SMEs. But a company who satisfies the um, R&D intensity criteria um, may instead be able to claim under ERIS, and we'll come on to ERIS now. Next slide, please, Ty. Great. 
So ERIS has strictly been, has been applicable um, for accounting periods starting 1st of April um, 23. But as I say, there's a there's a change in the definition of an R&D intensive SME um, as from the 1st of April 24. So ERIS operates similarly to the old R&D SME scheme in how the tax benefit is calculated. Um, loss making R&D intensive SMEs can deduct an extra 60% of their qualifying costs in calculating their adjusted trading loss, as well as the 100% deduction, which already appears in the accounts to make a total of 186% deduction. A company can surrender whichever is the lower of either the enhanced expenditure amount or the total unrelieved loss after taking the enhanced deduction for the period for a tax credit of 14.5%. However, unless exempt, the tax credit cannot exceed the, P exceed the POYE cap. So an SME is loss making if it makes a loss for tax purposes before the additional deduction. As I've said previously, if an SME is not loss making, it has to claim under the new merge scheme, the new RDEX scheme. To be able to um, claim under this scheme, the SME must meet the intensity condition. That is that the R&D expenditure is at least 40% of the company's total expenditure for the period um, in respect of um, expenditure from the 1st of April 23. But that's reduced to 30% for accounting periods from the 1st of April 24. And there is a one year grace period for companies that don't strictly fulfill the criteria. Next slide, please, Talia. So, as I said, um, the tax definition of R&D has, has not substantially changed despite all the reforms um, that I've just been discussing. Quick reminder as to, as to what this is, but I'm going to touch on obviously compliance in more detail later. The work that qualifies for R&D tax relief must be part of a specific project to make an advance in science or technology. Um, the advance is absolutely fundamental. The project must relate to the company's trade, either an existing one or one that the company intends to start up based on the results of the R&D. No claim can be made if the advance is in the arts, humanities or social sciences, including economics. So the key questions are, you know, what is the scientific or technological advancement? What scientific or technological uncertainties did you identify? What did you do to overcome the scientific or technological uncertainty? And why couldn't the solution be easily worked out by a competent professional in the field? But more on that later. Next slide, please, Talia. So as I said previously, the categories of allowable qualifying expenditure are the same across the new merge scheme and ERIS. Staff costs are, are, are allowable. Subcontracted R&D expenditure um, is allowable. However, um, there have been, in, 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 in saying that, um, there are restrictions on subcontracted R&D in respect of accounting periods from the 1st of April 24. And I've got a couple of slides dealing with what those um, restrictions are. And um, there has been an awful lot of um, confusion um, amongst agents as to what um, HMRC will allow as subcontracted R&D, you know, in terms of, where, where, you know, interpretation of contracts and so forth. Um, there is a draft guidance note that has just been published by HMRC on this point, um, but they have said they're going to publish um, more detailed guidance later on in the year. But there are some examples that HMRC have already provided in terms of the sort of situations um, that are allowable, recognised allowable now. Payments made to externally provided workers, although um, there are some restrictions in respect of accounting periods 1st of April 24 onwards, I'll come to that in a bit. Payments made to the subjects of clinical trials, um, software costs, um, data license and cloud computing. So um, this um, head of um, R&D expenditure was actually actually came into effect for accounting periods from the 1st of April 23. So this isn't strictly speaking a change associated with the, the merge scheme that's been in place since the 1st of April 23. But nevertheless, um, all these categories of R&D expenditure are applicable across both schemes and claims for consumables. So just a little reminder at the bottom in terms of the type of things that aren't um, allowable, capital expenditure, rent, rates, leasing costs, the cost of obtaining IP protection. Next slide, please. So as I've said, um, the rules preventing SMEs from claiming subsidised expenditure under the old SME scheme um, have been abolished for claims submitted under the merge scheme and ERIS in respect of accounting periods starting on or after 1st of April 24. Also, um, as I say, as regards subcontracted R&D, the approach has changed for accounting periods um, after the 1st of April 24. 
So as regards claims of subcontracted R&D, generally the party who decides to carry out the R&D will be the party which will make the claim going forwards. The claiming company has to prove that it intended or contemplated that R&D of that sort would be carried out by um, the subcontractor. There is a restriction, and I'll come to this, there's a slide on this in a few minutes. Um, subcontracted costs are subject to a restriction. This is from um, for accounting periods from the 1st of April 24 onwards. So sub they are subject to a massive restriction, which prevents any subcontracted costs from being included in R&D tax relief claim where the activity takes place abroad, um, unless um, there's a allowable reason within the legislation for the R&D activity taking place abroad. Um, so, Tali, if we could just go on to the next slide. So, um, actually, I'm not going to go through this in, in, in detail now. It's just an explanation as regards... Um, the, the need for subcontracted activity to take place in the UK and the steps effectively that somebody preparing a claim has to has to consider. Um, in some instances, um, subcontracted expenditure might need to be a portion between expenditure which is allowable because it takes place in the UK and and expenditure which is um, not allowable uh, because it's taking place overseas. The, the next slide is the critical one. So, Tali, if you can just move on to that. Okay, so this so this is basically so. Going forwards, accounting periods 1st of April 24 onwards, um, subcontracted R&D is not allowable if it takes place overseas unless it falls within um, the exception. And the exception is that the conditions necessary for the R&D are not present in the UK. Um, the conditions for the R&D are present in the location where the R&D is undertaken, and it would be wholly unreasonable for the company to replicate the conditions in the UK. The conditions in the, in the in the legislation whereby R&D is permitted to be carried out overseas includes, firstly, geographical, environmental or social conditions, or else legal or regulatory requirements as a result of which the R&D may not be undertaken in the UK. So um, a, a condition obviously does not include the cost of the R&D or the availability of workers to carry out the R&D. So this is a massive change in terms of the ability of companies to claim subcontracted R&D expenditure um, where the work is taking place overseas. It's not enough now for a UK company to be employing a subcontractor in China because the cost is cheaper overseas, unless that company can, can provide a really good reason as to why both the conditions for carrying out the R&D um, were present in China and they couldn't be replicated in the UK. So. Um, that's a that's a massive uh, um, departure from from what's happened previously, and it's caused a lot of obviously complaint um, from companies um, who do obviously have you know um, subcontract their expenditure to take their sub they subcontract their R and D overseas. Next um, slide, Talia, please. Um, similar restriction to externally provided workers as well. Um, as everybody knows, a company can claim the cost of payments made by an agency to agency workers carrying out R and D. If they're connected, 100% of the payment can be claimed. If they're unconnected, it's, it's restricted to 65%. But again, as with subcontracted R&D, for accounting periods from the 1st of April 24, EPW costs are subject to a restriction preventing them from qualifying where the activity takes place, takes place abroad, unless obviously it falls within one of the exemptions I've just um, discussed. And then just a reminder about data license and cloud computing, I've, I've mentioned this previously, but for accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 23, the definition of software has been expanded upon the legislation and companies can now claim for data storage, hosting costs, hardware facilities, operating systems and software platforms. Okay, um, that's me done and it's taken me 24 minutes. So I apologise, John, in advance. You, you, I, Please take as long as you want to in relation to your section, and then I'll come on to compliance in a, in a little while later. Thank you very much. Uh, no, that's absolutely fine, and uh, no problem with regards to time either. So, a uh, little bit of background on me: uh, business and uh, and technology, I suppose, science and uh, intellectual property for most of my career, quite a long career, I guess. Uh, very interested in the value of intellectual property, as uh, Carolyn just alluded to. Uh, at least 80%, it's a bold statement, I know, at least 80% of the value of any business is intangible can, and protected by intellectual property. 
look at the the net asset value on the balance sheet and uh, and subtract that from the value of the company, and there'll be a gap. Uh, and that gap is, uh, is, as I said, intangible, protected by intellectual property. Of course, there will be intangibles somewhere on the balance sheet, but those are generally goodwill that have been amortized, uh, appreciated over a period of time because they've been bought in from a, a third party. It doesn't reflect or represent the organically, the internally generated intellectual property. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Talia. Thank you. So yeah, I uh, I will touch on uh, innovation, which is it's, it's touched on a little bit as part of uh, Caroline's thirteen steps that she's uh, going to talk about subsequently. So, uh, but you know, just to build on the point about value of intellectual property, the uh, EU IPO recently comes out to the study, and they found uh, from an investment perspective, from a startup perspective. The companies with at least uh, one trademark and or patent were, I think it was four to eight times more likely to get investment than those without. Now, of course, you know, is it causative, causative or is it, uh, is it distinct? It, it, clearly, a company that's organized enough to have IP is probably organized and probably more likely to get investment, for sure. Uh, a recent White Post study showed that, uh, you know, from a, a business lending perspective, lending to companies with uh, any IP, uh, there was half, 50% less chance of there being a loss on that loan uh, than if uh, they didn't have any IP. So there is, a, there is a connection between value without any doubt of companies with intellectual property. Uh, I suppose the biggest challenge, of course, uh, or maybe not, of course, is for those businesses to recognize what they've got by way of intellectual property and then take the steps to go ahead and protect. I'm very fascinated by the whole area of innovation on what makes an innovative company. So I'll just do a couple of slides on uh, on innovation, but clearly having the inspiration and the vision and the brain power there in the first place is cru crucial. But then, of course, having the cultures and the framework, uh, teamwork and incentives to make uh, to make innovation happen. Next slide, please, Talia. Uh, what is the best environment for innovation? And, and of course, it varies by business. I, I think it's fair to say. I don't think many of many of us would dispute that it's difficult to innovate in a vacuum. It's a bit difficult, probably. Uh, to innovate in isolation and and definitely sort of interaction uh, is uh, and face to face is is where a lot of innovation occurs. But efficient innovation has got to have a harvesting process, a, a process of capturing, valuing, and protecting and managing that uh, that innovation. And uh, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes now on the next slides talking about that. So how do you go about? Identify good uh, innovation and uh, and what do you do with it? What is the process that goes from there? Next slide, please, Ty. I think uh, moderately humorous interlude. Uh, I was speaking to the uh, some of the people who know a certain department uh, at Dyson, where there are a number of ladies, and and uh, at the time, at least, I don't know whether this is the case now. This is probably eight years ago, uh, the engineers were predominantly male, predominantly male at uh, Dyson, and they were moving from their, their superb uh, technology and in, in, in suction, I suppose, and uh, and then onto blowing for hand dryers, and then they looked at hair dryers. And the ladies were all very surprised when they got the prototype to look at uh, that the, uh, the, the, the hair dryer had two handles. Now, being a man, I, I wasn't quite sure whether that was significant, but apparently... Ladies don't like to hold a hairdryer like this. They, they like to hold it in one hand and then use the other to, to brush or comb uh, or whatever the process. So that that was moderately amusing, but clearly innovation can't happen in a vacuum and you've got to do it as uh, close to the customer as possible. Next slide, please. I, I, I like to talk about the problem-solution pair. You know, what uh, the problem, what is the knot that we're trying to untie, that we're trying to escape from? And the solution is the method, the process, the 
the way of untying that knot. Uh, a new solution to a technical problem may be patentable, but the solution, the new solution must be non-obvious. And the technical uh, solution problem, sorry, can be of any nature. It can be how to save energy from an electric scooter, how to help machines be more accurate, how to make machines, drill rigs and motors be more efficient. And there's a lot of energy saving that goes on in that area. Thank you. Next slide, please. So once we've start, once we've identified the innovation, the problem solution pair, we need to capture certain components of that ownership, name of invention, field of invention, practical use cases, prior art. This is this is the nub of the issue. Is it is it novel? Is there anything else out there? And this is where it's a little bit vague, a little bit difficult to identify how good, how thorough is the search, how extensive is the search, and uh, it, it, you know, novelty is absolutely crucial. It's also crucial, I think, Caroline may say in the next couple of slides, to, uh, to R&D tax credits. Because if it's not perceived to be novel, then it's not going to be given uh, given uh, the status of uh, approval for, for tax credits. So, yeah, what is the problem that's being solved? How is it being solved before? How is this an improvement on the current solutions? The key questions around about innovation. Next slide please. Dahlia, next slide, please. Thank you. So once you've done the innovation, what are you going to do by way of protection? Now, the obvious thing for uh, a technical innovation or invention is going to be a patent. And in most cases, that makes most sense. Uh, it's a very strong form of protection for intellectual property. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's a surprise to many people, actually, that it's public disclosure. So if you get the patent registered in the UK, then everybody elsewhere in the world can read your patent and practice your patents if you don't have patent coverage in those countries. There is a there is a sort of payoff there. You do have to look at the risks. And then, of course, a patent gives you 20 years worth of protection, and it expires after that 20 years. Hence the race in the pharmaceutical industry to get out to the market as soon as possible, because you've spent 10 years, invested 10 years getting to market, possibly longer, then you've only got eight or 10 years to recoup that billion dollar plus investment in R&D. Trade secret, one of the fastest growing forms of intellectual property protection, useful for both, both technical inventions, but also for commercial uh, information, it's commercially valuable information as well. It's almost instantaneous, unlike a patent, which may take a couple of years to get full protection. Uh, in, in theory, it doesn't have a term. It can run forever, but it runs as long as it remains a secret. Uh, and the cons, if you don't keep it a secret, then it's escaped, then it's no longer a trade secret. So keeping the cat in the bag or the stopper in the bottle is absolutely crucial. Or the genie escapes and it's it's gone. You can't put it back in. Copyright, good for software code, uh, and it's freely available. Uh, but, so, but but copyright only protects the expression of the idea and not the idea itself. Uh, so uh, it always worth uh, bearing that in mind. Designs, for look and feel, think the iconic Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, very well worth considering, particularly for, for apps and software, but, but for other aspects of intellectual property as well. The term varies if it's not registered. You can have unregistered design rights to if it is registered and by country, but between, actually it should be between three and 25 years. Now you might be surprised that I've mentioned NDA, but of course NDA protects confidential information and, and in theory also possibly trade secrets. They are readily available. Downside is that most people don't give them the respect they deserve. So I think we've all signed lots of NDAs in our lifetime. Have we ever considered them, you know, two or three years down the line as to what we were protecting with that? Not always is the answer. Contracts, strong, can be strong, can be an alternative form of, uh, or a supplement, I should say, to intellectual property protection. Uh, and breach of contract is uh, is a good adjunct to intellectual property defense. Uh, of course, as with all legal action, it can be costly to enforce. Brand is a vague one, and uh, it's, it's only in certain circumstances. It can be highly valuable. 
uh, but it does take a long time to build up the sufficient intellectual property protection around about the brand to give you protection over innovation uh, if if it can be achieved at all. So thank you, uh, Talia. Next slide. Uh, so key questions that might be on an invention disclosure form, which leads to a patent. And the reason I'm laboring this a little bit is I, I, in my own mind, have formed the opinion that in order to qualify for R&D tax credits, you almost have to have a clear sort of innovation, uh, an invention discovery or capture form complete because that supports the process. Now, Caroline might might contend that in her next uh, in her next couple of slides, but this is what I would go through or we would go through with a patent attorney when we are identifying whether something is patentable. What's the general feel of the invention? What's the problem? Uh, what technical problem does does this solve, and how does it overcome existing problems and their solutions? Brief summary of the innovation. What are the essential features? What are the advantages and benefits? And a detail then a detailed description, and then some practical use cases. Next slide, please. And then you, as you're going through the intervention, harvesting or the innov innovation capture, you might look at it from this perspective. What do you want to achieve? What's the technical problem that's preventing it? And how does your, your solution tend to that problem or, or answer the solution to that problem? Next slide, please. And then finally, you do some form of assessment. Having gone through all of the above, you do have some sort of invention committee you may not call it that but you need to look at the key components of what you've just identified is it a new solution is it an improvement on existing solutions is there novelty is there any prior art is there anything out there already the key question is how do you find out i'm testing at the moment a, a natural language uh prior art search mod uh in uh, tool ai tool which might actually make it a lot easier for people to uh, to assess whether there is a prior art and whether there is novelty. What's the right IP protection strategy in this instance? Can we protect it with a patent? Should we also use trade secrets? Ownership is really important in patenting and getting that right is, is essential because incorrect ownership can, in theory, invalidate a patent. And date stamping is crucial in all intellectual property, i.e. the date it went it was proven data when it was created. Is the value of this to your business? Are there efficiencies that are provided? Does it does it confer competitive advantage? Are there any risks? Are there any risks to the business of pursuing this in innovation or not pursuing this innovation? From a financial perspective, do we have the budget for full IP protection? Do we need to schedule that over time? Can we realize innovation tax relief like R&D tax credits or patent box possibly. And then finally, you know, the decision committee summarizes all of the above as a true innovation. What are the benefits to the business? What is our IP protection strategy and how will that help us generate value? I am feeling that's my last slide, Talia. So please move on and we'll move on now to, uh, to Caroline. Thank you. You're on mute. Caroline, you're on mute. Thank you for to soften me there. I'll ask gavel on to myself. Um, no, thank you very much, John, for that. It's really interesting. Um, there is massive um, synergy between um, the tax definition for R and D and and patenting, which you which you've alluded to. Um, I haven't got time to go into that today, unfortunately. Uh, it's not it's not part of today's webinar. Um, I have written an article on it actually, which will be coming out um, fairly fairly soon for anybody that's anybody anybody that's interested. Um, but but yes, I mean if a if a company is going through that. Um, the patent due diligence process and I'll answering the sort of the questions concerning novelty, inventive step, etc., and can answer all of that in terms of yes, and it's affirmative to getting getting a patent, then um for sure they'll be eligible for RD tax credits because the tax definition is is very similar to the criteria for patenting. Um, but anyway, on the issue of compliance um in RD tax relief, um, if we could just move on Tali to the next slide. Okay, so fraud and abuse, like I said at the start, um, a huge concern. It's been on it's been on HMRC's radar since March twenty one. Um, if not, uh, if not before, um, HMRC has concerns, um, particularly as regards fraud and abuse in the SME scheme. Um, 
the, the concern is that is is everything from um, you know fraudulent claims being submitted. Obviously, historically, there was no requirement to file a technical narrative with a claim. So, um, obviously, some companies would just be um, submitting a claim um, without without a technical narrative, that, without any information about the R and D project uh, projects at all, just with the, just with the numbers and. Um, you know, at the very worst, um, claims were put forward where there was no qualifying R and D or no no project even. Um, and then obviously fraud isn't just about you know deliberate action; it's also um, exaggerated claims as well and boundary pushing. You know, boundary pushing the definition of R and D to um, extend it to projects which clearly aren't really advancing any field of science or technology. They might be tech, they might be projects involving technical difficulty, but not not necessarily advancing anything. So. Um, obviously, um, there was the widespread review of reliefs in 21. Um, and then um, following that, HMRC has introduced a number of different wide ranging steps to improve compliance and R&D tax reliefs. Um, they include the advanced notification form, which I'll come into in, come on to into a minute, the additional information form. Then um, in October last year, um, HMRC published um, a series of guidance um, to supplement the BEIS and DSIT guidelines, which is 13 steps to compliance. Um, as I've said, um, they've really ramped up their, um, the number of compliance um, checks. There was a mandatory ra a random inquiry program a little while ago. Um, a dedicated anti-abuse R&D unit was set up in, in July 2012, obviously for those dealing with SME um, com compliance checks. Everyone will be familiar with the Small Business Individual Compliance Unit, um, which operates very, very differently to um, how historic R&D uh, compliance checks would have been handled in that um, we don't have... Um, um, designated identifiable officers. Um, it is a faceless unit in the sense of who's dealing with the compliance check. And unfortunately, the approach is very different in that um, there's no, I don't think I've heard of anybody who's actually managed to have a meeting actually yet with it with an officer. Um, they do want to deal with the compliance checks on paper. Um, so it's a very, very different approach, very different landscape we're dealing with now in comparison to previous years. There's nudge letters, obviously, where HMRC um, have noticed that um, claims are being, you know, where, where there have been aggressive sales um, people um, targeting companies in specific industries which aren't traditionally associated with, with R&D or necessarily, you know, companies trying to advance anything in a field of science technology. Um, HMRC is on, literally, is, is, it will um, or has been issuing nudge letters to companies, you know, alerting them to the fact, you know, have you have you made a claim? Are you sure it was correct? Um, we don't, we know, we don't think you qualify that kind of thing. Um, the fraud investigation service obviously involved with um, certain agents, um, real clamp down on poor agent behavior um i i along with a lot of other people sit on the um research and development communication forum that hmrc has with the um, meetings twice a year and at the one before christmas um they did say that um, at the start of this year they were going to be um approaching agents who they had concerns about to um invite them to meetings to effectively like educate i i think in terms of um you know with, with the aim of um raising agent standards so um that was that was announced I, I personally haven't heard of any um agents who have been approached but certainly hmrc said that's what they were going to do um and then obviously we have the latest consultation where um to raise agent standards across the board um, views are now being sought as to what the best way of doing that would be. It's whether, you know, is our R&D agents going to be required to become members of um, recognised um, tax bodies? Um, or is it going to be sufficient for people to be supervised effect effectively by an expert advisory panel? Um, and the, the expert advisory panel that has been um, talked about being set up um, would be to um, get involved with educating um and also assisting HMRC as well um, in terms of improving standards within HMRC. So there's all this kind of um, happening um, all the time. I mean, H HMRC, um, for people on, at, the, at the sharp end of um, a compliance check, and you know, if, if anybody kind of reads posts on LinkedIn, there's an awful lot that you will see about, you know, with certain um, members of the tax, tax profession or community, you know, complaining about, um compliance checks they're dealing with or just hmrc's approach um you know very much think that um 
you know, HH Publishing has not, not been particularly, um, you know, friendly or um, supportive of businesses claiming R&D tax relief, but certainly um, any public, anything, uh, any guidance that's published by HMRC itself definitely focuses on what they call upstream compliance. So that's not, very much their focus is not on persecuting businesses or helping businesses go bust or anything like that, but it's very much on helping businesses to get it right before a claim is made and very much on very much on cleaning up the industry as well in terms of you know getting rid out of the marketplace um any agents that are encouraging businesses to make unscrupulous or incorrect claims and also as well as upstream compliance um focuses very much on a, a risk-based approach so there's a lot more data available to hmrc now um, as a result of the additional information forms and the advanced notification forms um, which have come in which came into play from from last year so now for the first time you know HMRC are able to they're able to know and identify which agents are preparing the claims and they're able to um, witness patterns of behavior which they can and give, to give them the opportunity to to educate those agents to identify them to meet with them and to you know if 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 needs be, stop those agents from um, being able to submit incorrect and abusive claims, as 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 the, as the case may be. Um, next slide, Talia. So, um, just very quickly, you know, dealing with the advanced notification forms. So, um, these are a requirement for any any R and D claims submitted um, on or after first of April for, for accounting period starting on or on or after first of April twenty three, where a company is claiming R&D tax relief for the first time. So there's a requirement you have to file an ANF before you actually submit the claim. Also, um, if the last R&D claim made by a company was more than three years before the last date of the claim notification period, in that case, um, if a company falls into that bracket, there's also a requirement to file an advanced notification form. Um, for those on, on the call who will be familiar with, with advanced notification forms, um, they are electronic um, and they are submitted through a portal. Um, in terms of um, you know when you need to know when you need to file it, um, you have to do it within the um, claim notification period, and the and the claim notification period is the start date of the relevant accounting period up to a period of six months following the end of the relevant accounting period. If you've got a company with a fifteen month period of account. But CNF, apologies, it should be ANF. The ANF must be filed by six months after the end of the second accounting period. So, by way of example, first first example here, um, if you have a client with an or company with an accounting period ended thirty first of March twenty four, um, the claim notification period would run from the first of April twenty three to the thirtieth of September twenty four for the for for, noti for filing the um, ANF. So, obviously, that's six months after the end of the accounting period in in, in question. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then I think I've got an example on here of um, of, a, of a company with um, an extended um, with a 15 month accounting period. So here, obviously, the claim notification would be between the 1st of January 24 and the 30th of September 25. So that's six months after the end of the second period of account. So um, if the rules aren't followed, um, HMRC will remove the R&D tax relief claim from the return. So the, a the ANF has to be filed first if it's a new R&D tax relief claim or one hasn't been filed within, within three years. Um, agents or companies can complete it. Um, within the ANF, um, a company has to give a high level summary of the R&D activity um, that's taken place within the relevant accounting period. Um, again, this is very much for HMRC to have information at an early point to be able to intervene should they consider that um, the R&D activity is not eligible. Um, and also um, you have to, on the form, provide details as to the identity of the R&D agent and the person, um, the, the senior officer at the firm, at, at the company concerned who's been involved in the claim. Again, an opportunity for a just firstly contact in terms of who HMRC is going to contact to discuss the details of the form. But it's also um, going to help them identify problems with agent behaviour. There is a box on the company tax return to um, put a cross in to confirm that the ANF has been filed before you send the tax return. Um, and just a note as well that for claims filed from the 8th of August, as well as the ANF, if you have to file the ANF, you might also have to file the additional information form. Sorry, you, sorry, you would actually have to file additional information form. Um, before the tax return is filed, so that's also a that's a compulsory document. So next um, slide, please, Talia. 
So um, just a bit about the additional information form. As I said, um, this is compulsory for all um, new R&D tax relief claims filings from the 8th of August last year. It came into being because, as I say, there was previously no obligation on a company to provide any technical information about the R&D projects. Um, and of course, that was causing massive problems. So now there is this additional information form, which uh, I'm aware, you know, some companies are completing that and, and not necessarily doing a technical narrative. Um, it is an electric ele electronic form. Um, it, for our purposes, it does not um, completely um, do away with the need to file, te to file a technical narrative, a full technical report. We 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 still do still do that, um, because quite frankly, there's more information that we want to give HMRC than actually the the additional information form will allow. So we just want to make sure our claims are are robust. So um, if, if obviously a company has a long period of account, you need to file separate AIFs for each accounting period. Um, what is, um, this is, and for, for those that might not have um, completed an AIF before, um, there are algorithms um, underpinning the AIF. Um, you, you fill it in in sections. Once you've actually completed one section, um, the, um, the form allows you to sort of carry on to the, to complete the remaining sections. Um, but, Quite near the start of the document, um, you have to tell HMRC about how many projects you've undertaken and also what the total R&D expenditure for the accounting period is. And as you, within that, there is intelligence within the document that effectively tells you how many projects you need to tell HMRC about effectively to cover a certain percentage of the R&D expenditure that's actually being claimed for the accounting period. Um, if you're claiming for between one and three projects, um, a company needs to tell HMRC about all the projects that cover 100% of the expenditure. If you're claiming for, for more than four projects, you need to tell HMRC of, about the lower of the projects that account for at least 50% of the expenditure with a minimum of three um, or 10. Um, obviously, um, you may have projects which under the old rules um, may have, there may have been, um, you may have um, claimed tax relief under the SME and ARDEC an ARDEX scheme for the same projects, um, depending on how the, how the expenditure was funded. Um, here, we, you have to consider the expenditure first and follow the rules about the amount of project information to be provided. So for example, if a company has eight SME projects and two ARDEC, um, the company must supply project information for enough of the SME projects that account for at least 50% of the expenditure. And then you would have to also tell HMRC about the two individual ARDEC projects. Probably haven't got more time to, to explain about this, so I'm have to, going to have to go on quickly. So next slide, please, Talia. Okay, I mentioned before, John mentioned as well, the 13 steps. So we've got new guidelines for compliance, which were issued by HMRC in October last year, which are really important. Um, I think as a, as a, as a um, method of good practice for anybody preparing an R&D tax relief claim, it would be a good idea to actually have this checklist and actually annex it to a technical narrative at the time that it's filed. Um, because it is good evidence to HMRC that you've actually followed their guidance and um, you can satisfy the 13 steps. So what are the 13 steps here? Um, HMRC states that the, comp that the competent professional in the relevant field of science and technology should, one, identify the projects that sought to, to create new knowledge or capability, two, confirm these projects relate to a qualifying field of science or technology, Three, name the exact uncertainties. Four, explain why the answer to each uncertainty was not readily deducible. Five, briefly set out both the state of relevant knowledge or capability in the field and why resolving these uncertainties would represent an advance in the overall knowledge. I realise I'm rushing here now. I've got about six minutes left. So, Tal, if you will turn over. Um, identify where each uncertainty began and would end. Briefly explain the approach. Set out the plan. Set out the steps. So, Obviously, um, this isn't actually a, any change to um, the guy, you know, how R&D claims had to be compliant historically. It's just that HMR, with all the obviously focus that HMRC has, you know, increased compliance focus, they've published these guidelines now on to, to sort of really clarify and put in writing what, what their expectations are. And as I say, for, you know, for a company submitting a claim in the future, it, it should be a really good idea to to, to annex this to a claim to evidence to HMRC how the steps you've taken to actually check that the claim is compliant and satisfies the criteria. Um, move Next slide, please, Salia. Okay, um, yeah, um, so I've, I've missed out 10 to 30, many, many apologies, but this, we've got steps one to nine are for the competent professional and then steps 10 to 11 are for the company or its agent supported by a competent professional. So this is obviously where we have to identify the activities that directly contributed 
the indirect activities, the costs and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, next slide, please, Talia. Um, HMRC has also, after a long, long period of time, issued some more guidance around what a competent professional is. Again, long awaited and, and really important. Um, there's a slide that I'm coming up to in a minute now about some of the themes that we're seeing in, in compliance checks from the individual small business compliance unit that's charged with obviously dealing with the SME compliance checks. And something that we see time and time again is HMRC questioning whether a company's competent professional is actually a sufficient competent professional for purposes of the R&D tax relief claim. So I've seen so many letters from HMRC and inquiries where I've been asked, tasked with dealing with an inquiry for a company where they've said no, just because somebody works in a business or has an interest in a field of science technologies does not make them an expert in that particular field. So they've issued guidance to help companies recognise whether or not when they're preparing a claim for R&D tax relief, their competent professional is going to stack up with HMRC's expectations as to what a competent professional is. So here, it's defined um, as someone suitably qualified or experienced in the field, usually someone directly involved in the project with professional expertise relevant to the advance being sought. It can be someone employed by the company or external. So in respect of their field of expertise, HMRC expects a competent professional to have all the following attributes. They must be knowledgeable about the relevant scientific or technological principles involved. They must be aware of the current state of knowledge in the field as a whole. They must have accumulated experience and have a successful track record. Next slide, Talia. Um, it's stressed, like I said, having worked in a field or having an intelligible interest alone doesn't make a person a competent professional. Good evidence may include one of the following examples. High level qualifications in the field alongside continuous professional development. So this is really important. There is an expectation that a competent professional will keep up to date with um, developments in their field of expertise. It could include a significant number of years experience working at a high level in the field, a good scientific publication record in the field. That's not, as I say, that's not mandatory. That's just an example. Industry awards or the public recognition for contributions to the field. Okay, next slide. So, um, as I said, a lot of, lot of um, huge number of compliance checks. Anecdotally, um, one in 20 R&D claims is being um, inquired into at the moment. So these are the things that I've seen in compliance checks that I've 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 personally seen, um, which I think are you know accepted as common as, as widespread throughout the industry. Not accepting the evidence of a co of a company's competent professionals, I've seen many instances of HMRC just not accepting what competent professionals for competent professionals say, instead preferring to carry out a Google search or looking on the internet to find something that is contradictory. Um, I have to and I hasten to add, often miss you know misapplying the guidelines as well to, to claims. And you know, we have a you know, it's really frustrating when when this happens. Disputing that competent professionals are appropriately qualified, this is quite commonplace. Sometimes HMRC has got a point, other times they haven't, and you think you know that is you know, a lot of time you a lot of time you do think HMRC is just ridiculous. Carrying out Google or internet searches, which I think is really not helpful. The amount of times I've seen HMRC say, your company has, you know, your client has not um, attempted in advance because look at this internet site, this other company has done something in the same space. That's a misapplication of the guidelines. You know, just because another company has done something similar does not mean that your client hasn't carried out R&D. Um, refusing to accept that scientific or technical challenges are complex or not readily deducible. Refusing meetings, I've said that, you know, these are these are sort of common themes that we're finding with with everyone's fine with compliance checks at the moment but don't but don't lose hope as i say um i haven't got time within this talk to talk about the compliance process um i'm painting a bit of a negative theme here but it's not all it's not all negative these, these are just um themes that you that you see um next slide please so in terms of you know what can you do to try and make your claim compliant or to reduce the risk of a compliance check from from hmrc so firstly um you know it sounds obvious, but before carrying out R&D in the future, make sure that the objectives, the scientific technical challenges are documented and the R&D journey is minuted. Keep the documents in a safe place. The HMRC loves documents, the compliance checks that I see and I deal with. Um, I'm asked for documents to evidence the um, to evidence the R and D to evidence the R and D objective, but to show the journey. You know, HMRC expects to see a journey from A to B. 
if a company is trying to advance a particular area of science and technology. Um, so they, they they ask to see routinely things like project plans, um, milestone um, achievements, emails, minutes from meetings, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, my advice for any company about to embark on R&D activity is to make sure that the, the the document trail is in place and that it's it's kept in it's kept in a safe place. It makes it so much easier when you come to submit the claim and, you know, heaven forbid you get a compliance check. It's far more it's far easier to answer questions and, and satisfy HMRC. When preparing to make a claim, seek help from appropriately qualified, competent professionals. So that's going to sound obvious as well. But, um, you know, if you're making a claim for R&D, just, you know, make sure that your competent professionals satisfy HMRC's criteria. It's not enough just having a report prepared by, um, you know, somebody in the business who has worked in the business for a long time, but isn't necessarily um, an expert in the in the field of science technology. Before claiming, consult the 13 step checklist I've, I've um, provided and annex it to the technical narrative to evidence compliance. Make sure you address HMRC's questions to the, to the points they, they, you know, which come up time and time again in terms of the advance, you know, what's the baseline position that was, that was, that was, um, that was out advanced, um, you know, what were the technical challenges and what was, what information was available in the public domain and make sure that if you're preparing a report, you answer these issues, these questions properly. Keep abreast of the reforms and changes. Apologies, this has been a really fast moving webinar, but as you can appreciate, there's been a lot of reform in a short space of time. It's easy to get stuff wrong. So um, keep abreast of the reforms and changes. If you're unsure, seek help. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, if you've done everything right and, and unfortunately you're on the receiving end of a compliance check, um, act quickly. Obviously don't ignore the correspondence, um, act quickly and seek advice. Um, as I say, I'm going to apologise again because I'm just, it's two minutes past two. I think we've done pretty well, to actually, John and I, to get through what we've done so far. Um, apologies, there's no time to ask questions kind of um, as we are on the webinar. But if you have questions, which I'm sure people will have, please feel free to um, put them in the Q&A or message us directly. And if anybody wants more information on a particular area, they would like another webinar or um, whatever it might be, again, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Caroline and John. Um, we do have our next webinar happening on Tuesday, the 30th of April. I will share this slide deck as well as the recording to everyone who has registered. Um, so that will be coming into your inbox either today or early tomorrow. But thank you again for your time and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.